Welcome to the JB's PowerCast, where we talk about industry news, events, performance parts, trucks and accessories, shop talk, and we'll even do a little bench racing. The JB's PowerCast starts now. We're back. Everything's okay. We survived. Everything's good. Um, yeah, we'll go right back to where we were talking with uh, news from GM. Yeah, absolutely. We'll jump back into that story. So Cadillac um, has their new flagship sedan coming out. Uh, it's called the Celestique. Okay. C-E-L-E-S-T-I-Q. Stop. Right. No U, no E, no anything else. Celestique. I don't know what language that is. As far as I know, it's nothing. I guess it's Cadillacians. <laughs> but a little French in there? Uh, it's almost a French word, no. but it's not quite a French word. Anyway, yeah. point being, um, at a you know a very closed door, hush hush, no photography, no video media right. thing, they have started showing this. So their new flagship car, big deal. Um, you know, it's supposed to be the height of luxury. We're talking about uh, it's got a slope design, almost looks like a fastback glass roof. Right. You know, super fancy interior. Um, the dash is supposed to be one seamless. LED infotainment dash piece, no brakes, no nothing. Um, what the head, the you know, the chief executive of Cadillac said, he said, expect the cost to be six figures, and it's not going to start with a one. Oh. So that's putting it wow. at a two hundred thousand dollar price point on a Cadillac. That's like Bentley, Rolls type of territory. Oh yeah. That's oh, yeah. kind of crazy. You know, that's like the most expensive Cadillac by almost two times. Right now, if you were to go buy one today, if you were to go, you know, price and build, um, the uh, whatever their top model, it's not the CTS anymore, but it's the one that replaced it. The CT5V, I think yeah. is what it's yeah. called. Yeah. yeah, That's at 95. Right. That's the most expensive one you could buy right now if you tried to. And this is two times the price of that. Uh, you know, I don't mean to be that guy, but... A two hundred thousand dollar GM is what we're talking about. Right? Mm -hmm. Is that right. insane? It it is insane because I mean you again North America where sure. I mean we're here we like the muscle car whatever we get it but you know when you drive a Rolls Royce off the lot it's still a Rolls Royce that carries the value that you, you paid for it. Correct. Yeah. Right. When so you drive you know we've all driven domestic vehicles here. It's you drive it off the lot you paid fifty for it. And it's now worth thirty. Yeah, you know, and mm -hmm. you got to think it's going to be similar to that, even in the futuristic luxury car that you're talking totally. about. Now, and I, I think they're trying to combat that a little bit with things like it's you know it's going to be limited production within the less than a thousand. Oh, okay. Okay, so right. very limited, right. sure. You know, hand built. They're really going for the European sort of luxury method. Right. But I don't know if it's going to play off. You know, those guys that and. Uh, They've sort of done this before, you know, some of the really, really high-end trim Cadillacs have hand-built interiors and this and that, and, you know, for example, Bossman's, he's got one of those high-end, you know, the interior is all handcrafted, Yeah. and his holds value pretty well, it but does. at the same time, when you drive that, and eventually it comes back around, that $200,000 ticket, what's that going to look like? You know, what's the value going to be? Is it going to retain, like, some of these really high-end European luxury cars? I don't think so. Yeah. I guess, and the other thing is, you know, if we're just talking locally, you want to drive that in in the in the pothole ridden Edmonton, you know, like, <laughs> right? You know, like the futuristic and everything is all state of the art, and and here you are, chattering your teeth going down 170th Street. Mm -hmm. You know, do we is there a marketplace in Edmonton? Like we're talking just Edmonton, but for a car like that, that somebody's going to drive all the time, or is it going to be that supercar esque that? It's only a nice day driver. I mean, I suspect that, you know, from, from everything we know about the look and the shape and the style and the price and the details, they've got to be chasing that, that you know, the guy that's got to have that, you know, numbered car, the one out of whatever. Yeah. But that typically hasn't been a Cadillac buyer. They're really trying to break into a new demo that they haven't had before. Sure. Typically, it's, you know, it's X age. It's usually typically North American. I, as far as I know, you know, Cadillac international sales isn't really that much of a thing. No. You don't see a lot of Cadillacs rolling around in Italy or Dubai. You don't. <laughs> you know, that's just no. not a thing. No. So are they trying to crack into that market or are they trying to get some of those buyers over on in North America who would normally buy something, again, like a, a high end, you know, like a Phantom or whatever? Sure. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing is, I mean, if, you, if we go back like 10 or 15 years, no one, no one would have ever thought that you'd pay... A uh, hundred thousand dollars for a truck. Oh, geez, no. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so it, it's funny how Cadillac must know something, or not Cadillac, but GM and the big companies know that. 
hey, the way the market's going, the way financing terms are these days that, you know, we talked about it previously, Corey, that, you know, your new Ford Raptor or your new fully loaded uh, uh, Denali is, is over $100,000. So six figures, but starting with a two, maybe 10 years from now, that's a financeable deal. Sure. And, yeah. and, and you finance it, you know, it's a generational thing. It's like, hey, son, you're, uh, you own a Cadillac now because once your dad's done, you're going to have it and keep the payments going. And I mean, yeah. and maybe, yeah. And, you know, I, I struggle to, to not play the value game. And that's right. just because of, you know, that's the, and I think, you know, you probably do the same thing. You look at something, you equate the cost, and you say, $200,000, wow, that car is probably really nice. So on the one end, we've got that. On the other end, we've got the housing market that's falling out. And it's like, you could have a one-off luxury GM, or you could have a pretty damn nice condo. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, well, I yeah. don't know. <laughs> yeah. Being car people, I think we uh, might take the former. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I guess, well, how many, how many parking stalls does that condo have? Yeah, no kidding. No. Two. Yeah. I'd like to think mm -hmm. so. I'm not parking that Cadillac outside. Outside. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to scrape the windshield with your scraper in the morning. <laughs> I can assume that's the thing that will never happen with this car. I, yeah. I yeah. completely yeah. agree with you. I, I completely Hope agree with not. you. Hope not. Um, so I guess we'll just continue on with, yeah. with GM as they, they had another teaser. Um, it's something that I'm sure everybody's seen and talked about and now you can purchase at dealerships. Electric vehicles, mm -hmm. hybrid vehicles. Um, I, last year, the year before, uh, was at Pomona, the Winter Nationals, and um, seen a beautiful Camaro with a Copo car. Didn't really pay much attention to it because it's the blue with the white stripe, so it's your typical traditional Camaro color. Um, it's got a parachute on it, it's got wheelie bars on it, you're expecting this big, loud, pushrod V8, naturally aspirated thing to, to make some noise. Didn't hear a damn thing out of it. Hmm. Seen a burnout, okay. Car backs up, pre-stages, stages, launches. It's got the wheels in the air about four feet, and it's flying down the track, and it goes by. You still don't hear anything other than the air it right. creates as it goes. And it went, uh, I have it written down here. 983 at 134 miles an hour. Damn. On an electric car. Mm -hmm. Really? So is that the is that the next thing? Like well, and it, so it's interesting you bring that up. Um, or you mentioned that Camaro in particular. They've they've sort of had these these race car, you know, electric Camaros for a while and they're almost more of, of a concept than they are. Sure. This is sort of like, hey, we're playing with this. So GM ran this this teaser ad, you know, saying that we're making a slew of new electric vehicles, as you were saying. And in that, one of them, it's an outline, but it's very clearly the shape of a Camaro. So that is telling mm. that there is some form of a production electric Camaro coming. Now, obviously, we've seen what Ford decided to do with the, I'm not going to say the Mustang, but with the name of the Mustang. <laughs> right. Well, it's you the Mach-E now. Is that the Mach-E? The Mach-E. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. The Mach-E. Mach that's a, yeah. I'm, let me be the first to say that is a terrible name. I think so too. I want to be paid I, to think of that shit up. Yeah. Like, I, who said it's going to be called the Mach E? And the guy, yes, you're right. Let's go. Yeah. Yes, good very idea. good. Very yeah. Promotion. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. It, it, so, like, and that you know, they've clearly taken a different approach with that. They obviously they looked at the Mustang and they said, well, we could put an electric engine in it. We could try and work it around. And they said no because, and I think they said no because. You'll have this. You'll have your Mustang, your GT, your you know your GT500, whatever. All the levels sure. up. All those basically follow a similar platform of the kind of muscle car. And then you'll have this electric one, and it really doesn't jive with any I of agree. those. So yep. they said, you know what? We got to make a separate thing. But they're really hinging on that Mustang name. Camaro, on the other hand, it seems like they might possibly just make an electric Camaro. So that kind of begs the question. And this is maybe the the trouble that Ford had, you know. Thematically, how do we get around the idea of an electric muscle car? So many of those iconic elements that make up that, that sect of a car, that specific thing, you know, the motor, the rear wheel drive, the sound, the feel, the feedback, those are, will all be gone. Right. And yeah. what does that leave you with? Will that be just a weird experience? You know, is it going to be like a fast, um, you know, Prius? I, I don't know. I, right. I, I don't know what that's going to feel. <laughs> you're you're yeah. absolutely yeah. right. It is the feedback. That yeah. it's the sensory feedback that you get. You know that you know in your in your car, you you have the windows down. You're listening to it. You're, I mean, Ferrari, Lamborghini, their signature. Yes, styling is incredible. 
But it's the sound. Of course. Mm -hmm. It's what you feel and you rev it, you know, and this is a Ferrari. Everybody can, wow, yeah, it is, right? So I don't know, Corey, do you, like, would you buy one? You know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, and I think a, a lot of it has to do with how does that make you feel? Because right. it's going to feel totally different. Right. Right. You know, part of that experience, part of that sensation, part of the reason why the muscle car thing has existed for, you know, effectively 70 years yeah. is that there's this analog thing to it. You know? Sure. There's the motor and the smell sure. and the, you remove all that. And I'm not saying that I'm against electric sports cars. They no. have their place and they're of super, course. super cool. Yeah. Full speed ahead. Let's do it. Yeah. But, you know, combining the two into one, I don't know what the result's going to be. Um, I don't know. Yeah, and, and, and I'm with you on that, like, because, again, I'm not against the electric either, but, you know, I guess for myself, I've always been that, you know, uh, if I'm buying a Challenger, I want the SRT8, I want the, yeah, the, exactly. the V8, yeah. I want the manual, right? But then you see 100,000 of those cars and, you know, Challengers, Mustangs, and they're a V6, they're now an EcoBoost in the Mustang, that the people enjoy the styling, mm -hmm. have a great sound system in them, I, I would mm -hmm. make the assumption, yep. and, and they actually enjoy the look of the car, Maybe not as much as the. So here's a here's a the thought, other side. here's a thought experiment. Do you think that GM is going to dabble with doing a? You know, there's a lot of manufacturers that do this now. BMW does it actually really well. Um, they get a lot of flack for it, but they do a good job. Do you think that GM is going to experiment with faking the sound? Oh, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. Through right? the, through the speakers. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. like BMW, and I don't remember exactly the 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 series and the sure. motor and what sure. you know which car they do it on, but. I know that, and they're still they're still you know petrol motors. They're not electric, but they do a really good job of sort of doing a synthesized or an enhanced engine noise that comes through the speakers. You know, they're perfectly rev matched. It is very convincing. I'm curious if GM's going to take a similar approach, or if they're just going to fully ride out electric and be like, "Hey, man, it's a silent Camaro. You like it or you hate it." Right. That's interesting. I don't know. I mean. <sighs> Because mind you, you only hear it on the inside. Right. That's what I like. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But isn't that what it's for? I, I, it, aren't you the one supposed to enjoy the sound and the listen? But I mean, as as, as guys, it's about the show off too. Like, yeah. I was gonna yeah. say. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, is it you know, for just you, or you know, is it for you I don't, and everybody? Right. Yeah. You know, like I'm not sure. It's, mm -hmm. it's interesting though. Like I think we're in a cool time in the in the car industry where, you know, they're literally trying to reinvent the car. 100%. Yeah. yeah, they're you know. coming up with some really interesting ideas and interesting ways to apply them. And again, you know, like where it's trickled down to now, electric cars used to be a pretty heady thing. You know, Tesla really did some groundbreaking work. And now we're getting them to, you know, I would argue that a Camaro is very much still the working man's sports car. Sure. Right? Of course. And now we're sort of getting into the realm where people who probably were never, ever, ever, ever an electric car customer before, i.e. the Camaro buyer, yep. is now like, oh, I can buy an electric Camaro. You know, it's a weird crossover, but probably for the best. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, well, I guess we'll, uh, we're always interested. So, you know, send us a comment, feedback, questions. I mean, we'd like to know what other people think as well. Um, we'll move on, I guess, into a yep. um, question for you, Sierra. What's up? You into power sports? Yeah. yeah, always have been. Yeah, no, I think I was six or seven years old, and my dad bought me and my little sister a little 90cc Yamaha quad. Cool. At, we kept it out at the cabin when we were little, little, and we just burned around the yard, and we'd take it out in the snow, and then we ended up getting a little sled when we were little kids, too, and we always had a lot of fun cool. out at the cabin. Yeah. Right on. The reason I ask, if, if you've been to our Northside store, recently, um, you probably, probably noticed some changes. And I don't know if you guys have had the chance, I obviously work out of the West like I do, but <laughs> if, if, if you've been down there, you've noticed that, hey, the store seems like it's changing a bit. And if you really looked, you've seen the sign on there that said we're moving. Um, it's a really exciting time. We are moving to, uh, uh, not that far away actually, just up the road, 97th yeah. Street in Yellowhead, um, to share a building with a company called Alberta Cycle. Um, now, Alberta Cycle has all the power sports toys you could ever Everything. want. Everything. You know, sleds, quads, bikes, accessories, you name it. And the synergy, and the reason I asked you, Sierra, is that it's like the ultimate haven for the motorsport, power sport enthusiast. Yeah. You know, it's going to be a super center 
of everything that you know, runs on gas. It runs on <laughs> gas, right? You know, not not the environmentalist area, but yeah. hey, get in there. Um, you know, it's a redesign. Uh, the the two stores are going to mesh together very well. Um, they're uh, um, one entrance for the for the Alberta Cycle, the other entrance for the JB's Power Center. But you can flow through the store. You know, two point of sales again, two separate businesses, but sharing a footprint of hey, bring your sled, bring your bike, bring your muscle car. Your parts are available. Everything's there. Sure. So. It's exciting. I mean, what is motorsports if not an extension of um, automotive sports and yeah. vice versa? Exactly. You know, it, it just makes sense conceptually for the two to, to be paired up. Um, again, most guys that are into power sports are also into motorsports, are also into cars. Yeah. I've never met a bike guy that doesn't like cars, and I've never met a car guy that isn't at least a little bit interested in bikes. Right. Um, yeah, totally. It is it's it is very exciting. Yeah. 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 I look forward to seeing um, the coming changes and what's going to happen and um, how how things get sort of fleshed out. And yeah, it'll be exciting. Yeah, it, it is. And, and I think that the concept that they're taking with the the two stores together, no real divider, and it's just open. Mm -hmm. It's cool. The other really cool thing is is they're going to have a bistro, a little coffee place in there that you know you can grab a coffee, browse through, take your time. You know, it's not the jump in and get out. You know, we yeah. want you to spend some time there. So, look for the signs, watch Facebook. You know, we're uh, we're excited. It's going to be a real cool place, and uh, um, yeah, hopefully sooner than later. I think in, they're thinking April, really, really early April. So that's pretty soon. Um, yeah. I mean, but, that's a month away. But yeah, but uh, watch Facebook and, and watch posts. And Definitely. If you talk to the guys in the store, they'll have the latest information for sure. Awesome. So take a quick commercial break, and we'll come back with our uh, our next segment of the show. Sounds good. This is Bobby. He's hard at work dreaming of owning a fifth wheel trailer. Bobby drives a diesel pickup truck. He needs more power that he can get with a bigger and more efficient turbocharger. If only there was an easy way for him to get that turbocharger for his truck today. That's right, Bobby. JB's has got an instant approval, no credit check financing program. And while he's getting the upgrade at JB's Install Center, it would be a perfect time to add some other accessories that Bobby would love to have. Come get approved for no credit check financing today at JB's Power Center. We're back. That was uh, quite the commercial, Corey. Uh, or Bobby, I should I say. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, that's, oh, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the split we were talking <laughs> about. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh -huh. No, that wasn't, no, yeah, no, 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 that's, that, oh, you thought it was me. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 you're mistaken. That's, yeah, no, that's, I have a, I have a double. Oh. Yeah, it does all my commercial work. Yeah. Does oh. help you out. Housework do? No. Unfortunately, <laughs> no. If you ever get to that spot, you let me know how that works. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, we're going to move into it, something we haven't done before, but uh, you know we want to you know let everyone know kind of who we are, what we're into, um, automotive related, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> we won't go that far, not yet, anyways. But uh, um, yeah, so it, it's it's something new. We're going to give it a shot here, and uh, so I guess with Corey first. What got you into cars? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I think um, a lot of people sort of have a similar, you know, story. My dad, my uncle, my grandpa, yep. whatever it is. Um, you know, no slight at my dad, but he was never a car guy, really. Right. Never into cars. Um, I didn't really grow up around cars. Something just went off in my brain when I turned 16. And I bought a car out of functionality and necessity. And... Um, Thankfully, you know, some of my best friends at the time in high school were very much into cars and um, hung around with them quite a bit. And then I just really wanted to know everything about my car and other cars and how to fix cars and how to do things to cars. So cool. I went on a tirade of buying, you know, car magazines and I got into car audio pretty early. I worked at Future Shop at the time. And um, yeah, I, I just sort of went nuts absorbing all the knowledge that I possibly could. Sure. And it sort of snowballed. From there, yeah. yeah. Nice. What about you, Sarah? What was your, uh, your I, first car? My my first car was a 2003 or 2004. I can't remember Pontiac Grand Am. Okay. And that thing lasted about five months. My cousin Craig gave it to me. Okay. And he told me, like, here you go. You can have a car for free. The head gasket is sweating. <laughs> Let's see how far you make it. And I got about four and a half months. And then. 
like two days before we were going to the Dominican Republic, I filled it up with gas and then I went to start it at the pumps and it was just, no, nothing. So we ended up just getting the Kidney Car Foundation to come pick it up from co-op and I went to the Dominican and came back from the Dominican, car was gone. So well, that, that, that was my first car, but I, cause I only had it for like half a year. I don't really consider it my first car. After that, I had a 96 Miata and that was my oh, first stick shift. That's a great first car. Yeah. Let me just, let me say, <laughs> I don't know, we haven't got to you, Adele, yet, but that's so much better than my first car. I had... What was yours, Corey? You know, okay, I like to play this game really quick. Sorry I, no. to cut your story off. Um, my first car is a car that's so rare, I've, I've only ever seen one of them in person, and it's mine. And this is the game that I like to play. I'm going to tell you the car, and I'll bet you $100 you don't know what it looks like from your head. You might be thinking you do, but I guarantee you don't. I actually, I wish I would have given a picture um, to Stephen to put up on the feed. Okay. So it's a 1986 Pontiac Phoenix SJ Coupe. Not a chance. No Couldn't idea. Tell no. You. Nobody knows. No. no. Literally, the only one I've ever seen in my life is the one that I had. And actually, to that point, that car, my first car, is always the thing that I use to prove that rarity does not equate value. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> There's ten of them, and right. they're not worth a flipping thing. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you end up with that? Like, I how? Um, my neighbors at the time, their you know now grown son, that sure. was his car in like university or something. Okay, and they had it parked in the back of their driveway with a cover on it. Since I remembered, I'd never seen the car ever. And I was you know my dad was trying to help me find a car and blah of blah blah. He was talking to the neighbor, and they goes, oh shit, I got a car. Okay, so we go take a look. Takes the cover off of it. So picture, um, picture '80s boxy. Um, that sort of, yeah, everyone is kind of doing like we want to make a sports car, but we're not done with muscle cars yet. Right. Smaller, right. still very squared. It's sort of like Fox Body meets Buick Skylark meets um, uh, K Car. Wow. Yeah. So front wheel drive. That classic 2.8 liter GM V6, okay, trusty yeah. old 2.8. Yeah, that was in a million things. <laughs> um, yeah, super cool. I mean, I thought it was a super cool <laughs> well, car. And I was like, "What you? do you want for it?" And the guy's, you know, I don't know, 500 bucks. Done. Done. Yeah. So there yeah, that was that was that was the first car. Yeah, I'm gonna Google that after. I, Please I, do. Yeah, actually, I, I, actually, here's a fun thing, and I'll show you this later. If you Google 1986 Pontiac Phoenix SJ, <laughs> no word of a lie, on the first Google page, you will see a picture of my car that I took in my driveway in 2002, maybe 2001. <laughs> That's how rare they are. Is that one of the pictures is my picture? <laughs> <laughs> I guess the lot. What did you sell it for? Uh, Twelve hundred bucks. Oh, you did good. Bucks. There yeah. you go. How long yeah. did you have it? Um, I don't know, maybe not quite a year. I sold it to a friend of mine, and then she, <laughs> she crashed it or got wrecked. Oh, okay. I don't really remember, but right. it was, you know, that was maybe the last one. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That, hey, but it was your car. But right? it was my yeah. first car, and I loved it. And actually, we, in a previous episode, I mentioned that uh, I had a carbureted first car, mm -hmm. and that was it. Oh, okay. It was a carbed 2.8. Oh, wow. What a piece of crap. Yeah, but, yeah. Man, I, uh, my... It was freedom. My now wife can attest that um, that thing would frequently die on the side, and I would get mad, and I would punch my dash. You know, all the things that a 17-year-old does. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, well, oh, well oh, so what was your first car, then? Um, interesting, like, like you said, dad, uncle, they were into cars, their, their uh, you know, pictures on the wall, typical stuff to get me into it. But my first car was a 1975 Mercedes-Benz. First car? Wow. First yeah, car. Easy, easy baller. Well, but here's the catch, though. <laughs> It was a 300 diesel. Okay, less baller. Okay. <laughs> it was yeah. a snot green in color. Okay. Okay. Down at 5% down. less baller. Exactly. So here I am. I was working at the grocery store, four bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. Made the deal with my dad because he had owned it. Got the car. The catch was in the wintertime, I couldn't turn it off. It being an old diesel, had I turned it off in the winter, it would not start, even <laughs> if it was plugged in. <laughs> so I would pull up to school. Parked in the parking lot, and, and that had an idle that I could idle it right down, uh -huh. and it would sit there and clack all day long <laughs> in an idle. Uh, that's a good. And then I drive back home. Yeah, and no one ever stole it. it of, of course not. No. You could get out and run faster than that thing could accelerate <laughs> to to two hundred. And I think you know, I wanted a Honda when I like a, there was a cool uh, Civic Coupe or sure, something no that didn't. was yep. right because I thought stereo and I thought all this stuff, but you know, my dad said, hey. This is the one you can get. And I think he did it on purpose because mm. he realized that I wasn't going to get a speeding ticket. I wasn't going to get a stunting ticket. 
because you couldn't do anything fast in the car at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And by the time you were going fast, you needed 14 kilometers to get there. I think my dad had, had a similar approach. That Pontiac isn't the first car that I asked for. You know, right. I, I first found a Camaro, right. uh, 79. Dad said no. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't understand why. Yeah, sure. Um, I actually found, I lived in Grand Prairie at the time, found in Edmonton a great deal on a, um, I don't remember the year exactly, but it was, a, it was looking back now, insanely cheap. At the time, it was right. more than I could afford, right. but it was a CUDA. My oh. dad said, no. Oh. Yeah. Really, really missed out yeah. on that one. Yeah. But <laughs> Investment. Yeah, yes. exactly. But now I, I get it. I totally well, understand. For sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. for sure. Found a card that says, that's safe. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Not popular. Not, Not popular. No one's going to steal it. No. You yeah. can't go fast. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, it's yours, son. Take it. <laughs> um, Sierra, I know that, um, you know, you've been involved with racing a lot. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, I know that uh, you've told us anyways that, you know, you've, uh, uh, your dad used to take you to the track and to the yeah. events and stuff. Um, but you actually had, like, first-hand experience at the racetrack, right? Oh, yeah, of course. Like, I think I was probably 9 or 10 years old the first time I ever went to my Rocky, my first Rocky Mountain Nationals event, and it was my dad. And my dad's got a ton of brothers, sure. and we would all go as a big family, and I'd be, be there with all my uncles and my cousins, and that was just it. And I... <sighs> I didn't understand why I liked it so much because when I was like a young girl, I guess like I wasn't supposed to like it. Right. Like I just kind of felt like this is not right. But then like by the time I was like 13 years old, I just I found everything like I had pictures of skylines and sure. tuner cars yep. all over my room and everything. And I just kind of started realizing like this cars were my thing. But yeah, racing is definitely like drag racing specifically is, is, is my thing for sure. Like. I, I feel so grateful that I ended up working at Castrol for the two years that I did. Like, that was just the coolest experience of my sure. life, being able to be, like, right there, like, when you can reach out and just, like, touch the funny car. Like, sure. it's, it's so cool, and I wish I could do it again. But just working during the week and then trying to do the racing on the weekends, it's so, it's, it's so much. Like, it doesn't seem like it'd be a lot, but in the summer, it's sure. a lot. It was... But it, it, it was just so cool to be able to stand right there and, like, all the stuff that I've been in the stands watching for my whole life and then watching on TV, watching Brittany and Courtney and Ashley Force. Sure. And, like, it, it was always something I, I wanted to do, but, like, I didn't know how to get there. And when, I went to the, when I went to the hiring thing that they had for Casserole, I went there and I was like, oh, I'm going to go serve beer and I'm going to watch racing all day. And sure. then they were like... Oh, you can pick like which area you want to go to and when they when I found out like I could work as drag staff I was like shut the front door <laughs> right. like this yeah. is the best day of my life right. so it, it was really cool that's great really cool that, that's really cool I mean getting to work as the drag staff you know standing next to the cars mm -hmm. and 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 basically learning their capabilities I mean yeah. you could watch from the stands but until you stand next to that yeah. top fuel dragster and yeah actually feel and see what it actually does from one yeah. foot away, well, it like, changes your perspective. That that dark side car from Calgary especially, like yep. if you've been to the track, you know exactly which car I'm talking about, but like when you stand just on the other side of that concrete barrier and you're standing there with your phone trying to take a picture and you're doing this, yeah. trying to take a video because you can't see, you can't breathe, right. the force from that engine just running you can't move your chest properly to right. breathe like it's just insane and like the videos i do have the sound has created such distortion like you have no idea how much power these cars generate until you're that close it's right. interesting the, the kind of memories those things make i will never ever 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 forget the first time that i stood you know 20 feet away from a top fuel yeah and it's like somebody just punches you in the chest mm -hmm. in the oh, best yeah. possible way. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah it's, it's uh, breathtaking, very literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah very literally, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm crying, why? I can't breathe, yeah. why? Hang on, yeah. wait for it. And, and yeah, I first time I took my wife to the track, she was eight months pregnant with my son. And we're, we're at there, and, and she had no idea what top fuel, I explained it to her, mm -hmm. but, and uh, we're standing there, and she's like, well, why, why are we standing here? Like nothing, I'm like, well, you gotta wait. Yeah. So it finally started, you know, her eyes are, <laughs> she's crying and she's trying to get away and I'm holding her you're like no because no. you know I'm like my son's gonna get the taste of nitro <laughs> right now you know I want him to be the, the motorhead from the start right yeah we didn't talk for a while after that because sure. yeah, it, wasn't, oh, yeah. uh, it wasn't good um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think we all have similar passions, but you know, Corey, what um, you know for modifications? I know you've you know you've told me some of your cars, you know, the RX-7s and and stuff like that. Uh, what type of modifications were you into? What have you done? Um, I've done a pretty big slew of stuff. Um, you know, I've done. Everything from a motor swap to turbo upgrades to basic bolt-ons and take exhaust, suspension, brakes, um, uh, fuel. Most of it, um, you know, I. It's really just in the garage too, and a lot of it is like figuring it out as you go. Right. Real sort sure. of yeah, homebrew type stuff. Yep. Um, actually, that first car, that Phoenix, um, I think I had it for maybe about the same, maybe five or six months, and then um, it went pop done. So my dad and I, and again, keep in mind, my dad is not a car guy, nor is he mechanically inclined. Right. Again, much love, dad. Yeah, exactly. He's yeah. like, you know what? You're out of the will, Corey. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know what? Let's let's do a motor swap. I was like, hell yeah, let's do a motor swap. Right. You know, fast forward months. You know, what probably shouldn't have taken that long. But there's a couple of guys. I was 16. My, you know, dad. We were just like, all right, let's start taking stuff apart. But what a better you know, learning experience and, and honestly, you know, a great bonding experience too. Of course. Yeah. I've really just like, get in there, figure it out, hand tools yep. in our cold, non-heated garage. That's for sure, yep. And that really kind of kick-started me into being like, oh, so I can actually, if I spend the time and figure it out, you can basically do most of the work yourself. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, there's a few things obviously that require some specialized tools, but it's like, yep. if you're willing to put the time in and the learning, um, and you know, you throw a bit of money at it occasionally, man, no problem. So yeah, that's sort of kickstarted. I've, I, I'll, over the course of the cars that I've had, um, yeah, most, most things I've swapped at some point in time. Cool. Yeah. I know Sierra, you, you talk really well on the car audio side of things that, you know, like, <laughs> You know, you're, you're going to make your uh, Ford Explorer the have the baddest sound system anywhere in Edmonton. Yeah, you know? I well, I want to in a sense, but then car audio, like as much as I know about car audio, car audio is not my thing. Right. Like it, as crazy as that sounds, like I I do think I I actually I know a lot about car audio, but I have never spent any money on car audio. Not a single cent? No, no, mm. I really haven't other I than think, yeah. Yeah, we, can, we can fix that for yeah, you. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, like I haven't, just because like after, so my 96 Miata, that, that thing was pretty funny. That thing had one working speaker, but there was so much else wrong with that car. Like the um, the cluster lights didn't light up. So I, I at night, I just kind of have to watch how fast the white lines were going past to see how fast yeah. I was going. <laughs> I could kind of gauge like if I was speeding or not, like, whoa, they're, they're going pretty quick. Like I need to slow down. But Seems like a real accurate. Yeah, yeah. System. Like I, and uh, like I, we paid, Three hundred dollars for that car. Sure. So, like the chances of me fixing. I that. wish you could buy a uh, NA Miata for three hundred bucks these days. Yeah, like nope. it was my first yeah. stick shift. It was straight pipe. That thing was just annoying. But it so that thing. If there was any car I honestly needed to, it was probably that Miata. Right. But then that Miata died before anything else happened. Then I bought a, I had a Cobalt. That thing came with a Pioneer sound system, and it w really wasn't that bad. Right. Like, I, I just didn't really feel like I needed to spend the money on that thing. And, like, again, it was a 07 Cobalt. Like, it had a sunroof, but that's it. Like, it was so basic. And, like, I knew I wasn't going to keep it long, so I was like, no, I'm not spending money on the sound system in this car either. Then I bought the Genesis, and that thing had an that infinity. Was nice it it, it was, was nice cool. Car. It was yeah. it was really fun. It was just so not practical, and my two giant dogs like it just wasn't gonna last. So that thing had um, the infinity system in it, and I I I had plans to to switch it out. I I had an amplifier that I was gonna put in it, and I was gonna switch the sub out. And then just as it went on, I just realized I needed to stop throwing any money whatsoever at that car because I was going to trade it in immediately. And then I got the Explorer. Now, this one, I, I think I'm going to look into getting like a custom sub box made to go where the factory one came out of because it's got cool. the Sony system in it. But like any Ford owner can say like that Sony system's good for like the first two days. Then you're like, yeah, I'm over it. It's not loud enough. So, um, yeah, I think maybe I'd do some car audio type things to this car, but I don't really... As dumb as it sounds, like for somebody who works at a parts store, I don't do very, very much to my own vehicles. <laughs> I have cold air intakes. I put a blow-off valve on the Genesis, remote starters. I spent a lot of money on lights, actually, for the Genesis. Right. But other than that, like, I kind of, like, 
this explorer i want it to just like be a daily driver like i don't want to go and like tune it because i'm just I want it to last and I don't want to do anything that could potentially cause me problems down sure. the road. So as much as I want to make it into like a race explorer, I'll probably just end up spending money on doing um, like accessory type upgrades and no, stuff like that. Sure, and then, 100%. Yeah, there's no, there's no right or wrong yeah, way to do it. I um, want to yeah. I wanna put like a catch can on it and probably an air intake. There's a boiler kit for it, but other than bolt-ons, I don't think I'm going to touch this thing really. That's okay. So, and you know, and now that I have something that's going to be good and reliable, I think it might be time for a project vehicle. Right. Like me and me and my boyfriend, we've got a, a six two out of a 2014 Chevy truck, and like I'd like to see what we could possibly put around that because like, we've Cobalt? got. I was going to say, yeah. go find that. Go find <laughs> yeah, that. Right. Go find that busted ass Miata. Put yeah, that, yeah. Put that back in there. there. Yeah. So like we've got like we've got something that we could potentially like build off of, but like I don't know what the hell we could put yeah. that in. So, Nothing like, says Euro Albertan like a six two six in a two Miata. swapped right. in a Damn Miata, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> you've well, and Nadal, you've got some experience oh, modifying yeah. and yeah. turning wrenches, and I probably more than probably more than both of us combined. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it, it's 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 very similar to what you said, Corey. It's um, you know changing the doing a motor swap. You know, my uncle Gordy coming up from Kelowna and. And in the cold garage, you know, pulling the motor and putting a motor in, into my duster and, and learning about it. Like you said, you know, yeah, it was great having him there because he knew he had done it a million times. But, you know, it's learning the step-by-step -step process. And once you know it, you know it, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't mean you have to do it every time. But, you know, it's, it's something that you learn. And, and over the years, I actually enjoy working on cars just as much as I do driving them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I, I take a lot of pride in saying that I accomplished something, I put something together, I sure. did something. And, and yeah, at, you know, in, my, in that Mercedes, the stereo system, I managed to find two Alpine 6x9s that I screwed to the back deck yeah. lid, right? And it had a German, um, some type of a radio, mm -hmm. I can't remember what it was called. The gauges weren't in English, but anyways. But I had CDs, that was the thing at the time, you know, Dance mix now one now two <laughs> totally way before you Siri let me tell you no but I I kind of remember those it was a it was a tape deck and then I went to uh, International Stereo mm -hmm. I think yeah and I got the CD Walkman with the tape thing that uh -huh. right yeah, you know absolutely the it, tape adapter the tape yeah. adapter and the shock wave thing and that thing used to stick with two way tape on the seat next to me and <laughs> hey I was it was it was living the dream it was cruising yeah. right like. Not too many kids had a, had a Mercedes at 16. No, absolutely yeah. not. I had a snot green one. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was cool. But uh, yeah, I, don't, I think everybody's story is very similar. Like we all have a passion. We all, uh, you know, whether that be, you know, doing a motor swap or just doing something cosmetic, it's all about a passion for, mm -hmm. for cars and motorsports and power sports in general. But before we switch gears, uh, dream car, Corey, what would it be? You know, um, I've... <sighs> I always struggle with this one, obviously. Yeah. I think we have a similar thing in that I like too many things is the problem. Sure. Yep. And um, I've been lucky enough that I have gotten the chance to own one of my dream cars, and it's crossed off the list, right. um, which was my RX-7, which was my 93. Yep. Um, but there is one car that, since it came out, it always seems to hold a, a special spot in my heart, and I, I don't know what it is, but it really just ticks all the boxes for me. Um, and I'm not even like, so it's an Audi R8 V10. I'm not cool. even a huge Audi guy necessarily. Yeah. I'm not even a huge hypercar guy, supercar guy. Sure. Just something about the combination of the style, the sound, that V10, um, the look of it, the all-wheel drive. It's basically, um, it's, and I mean the, the current one, it's basically a Lamborghini Huracan in a tuxedo right yep. which to me is just like it's so classy and it sounds amazing and it goes fast and it looks good i don't know something about that car since its first iteration to the current one r8 is just you know if i won the lottery and i could only buy one car cash money that would be it. that might be it yeah, yeah. i've always loved that it, it they're a great looking car mm -hmm. like you can't deny the fact that they're a great looking car yeah. what about you sarah uh, 1975, snot green Mercedes. No, I'm yep. just yeah. <laughs> Funny story. I know where the car is. Yeah. Oh, you know? really? And, Perfect. And, and the reason we sold it. So driving with my brother, we're going to hockey somewhere. It's raining outside. And, you know, we're hitting every puddle we possibly can. So hit a big puddle, Main Street, Lac La Biche, or somewhere in the area. And I look over, my brother's face is wet. I'm like, why would you have the window down 
Of course. And it's yeah, raining. Yeah, yeah. He's like, that came through the floor, man. That's not, <laughs> <laughs> there's something wrong. Yeah. It was rusted just a little bit. A little right? rust. But, uh, no, all seriousness, no, the dream car, like, I couldn't even, like, I sat there and I just watched the little thing on the Word document as I tried to answer this question. Um, my dream car, uh, the best answer I could come up with is a dragster. Okay. It is something not street legal. I would, sure. That's if okay. I could have anything, it car. would be I, to race a rail car. I would cool. love it so much. But if we want to talk like street legal, then I'm all over the map because, like, I still want like an 01 Nissan Skyline. I want a minty 97 12 valve Cummins. I want a brand new Mercedes G Wagon. Like, Wow. So, uh, you need to win the lottery. Uh, yeah. yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, you need many millions of dollars. Yes. Chevy 2 Nova, just like Daddy Dave's car. Like, sure. I. Yeah, I have 14,000 answers to that one, but number one, dragster. Hmm. And I'm sorry to all my door car friends at the track yeah. that might be watching, but no, I'm, I'm dragster. <laughs> what okay. about you, Adele? Dream car, number one, pick one today, lottery, go, bye. Hemi Roadrunner, 1970, 69. Mm -hmm. Mopar, it doesn't change, it's, unf you know, it's, it's in there, so. Mm -hmm. Supercar, like, if, if I was to win the lottery, you would have a few, I would assume. Like, it's, it's you know, depending on the... How much of the lottery sure. you win? Yeah, but yeah, uh, I would have to That'd think. That'd be the you one. Know, then. Muscle car, you know, I would think that that would be the one. And I mean, they're over a hundred thousand dollars for the totally. specific yeah. one. But yeah. hey, I would be the guy you'd see on Barrett Jackson smiling. You know? <laughs> totally. You don't really. Yeah, yeah. You just keeps going <laughs> yeah, up. You yeah. don't really care. What it, it doesn't is. matter. Yeah. I want 101, it. Right? Yeah. 105, yeah. 120. Yeah. Exactly. You know. So yeah, I think that would be it. But uh, that's interesting. Well, that's three very different, but all totally good answers. You bet. Yeah. Yeah. You awesome. Bet. Well, I think we're going to take one more quick break, and when we come back, we're going to do our last segment, uh, which sort of the reverse of million dollars is all about <laughs> budgets, actually. Yeah. Yep. Um, so we'll see you back in a minute. If you love your car, you need to subscribe to JB's YouTube channel right now. Why, you ask? You get the latest updates and footage from local events. You stay up to date on the latest products. You get to see cool vehicles that come through our shop. And you get the latest information on upcoming contests. Who doesn't love free stuff? And if that's not enough of a reason, consider this. Do you like to support local businesses? JB's is Alberta owned and operated and we've been in the industry for over 54 years. In that amount of time, we have been upgrading our customers' cars from mild to wild and helping them attain goals of awesome performance. If you love your ride, do yourself a favor and subscribe to our channel today. Hey guys, we welcome back. Um, <laughs> and so we're going to move into our last little uh, segment here for today, which is making the most of your dollars and specifically some of the best value products you can get for under $500. That's sort of the, the pretty arbitrary budget that we set because, you know, 500 bucks, anything under there, most people tend to, that's sort of a, a good playing space for them. Um, yep. So we've all got a sort of a handful of, uh, of ideas, products. Some of them are very specific, this item. Some of them are a little more generalized, but We'll, um, we'll throw them out there. So uh, the things that I came up with, um, I'm a car stereo guy. We sort of glazed over that a little bit. I know that you do a lot mm -hmm. of car stereo sales. Yep. Um, less e literal experience yeah. in your vehicle. Yeah. I've always had something in my car for a stereo. Some of it's been a big build. Some of it's been minor. But um, it's, it's just one of those things that I have always liked having. So one of the issues with car stereo is people always assume, oh, you're going to do a stereo. It's a build, and you need amps and amp sure. racks and custom boxes and yep. installs and all this, and it's a thousand, two thousand dollars. Well, it can be. You can actually add some pretty good sound on a totally reasonable budget. So, the thing that most people are looking for is bass. So, um, I like to call these products bass on a budget. These are self-contained, self-powered enclosure, sub, amp, the whole thing built in. So this one in particular is the DS18. A lot of guys make this one. JVC has a killer one. Kenwood has a killer one. The diamond piece is honestly amazing. Right. So the whole idea is you want to add some bass. You don't want to be worried about a lot of integration, a lot of cost. These will integrate with a factory head unit, aftermarket head unit, all contained, all sealed. You hide it in your trunk somewhere. They look sort of like a factory sub, but man, oh man, they perform really, really well. The one that I have in my Subaru right now is a piece from Hertz, and it's a cube. It's an eight-inch sub. It really looks tiny. You hide it away, but you know the things. Obviously, because they're all self-contained, they're tuned for that box, right? Right. And so I often, you know, I'll get people in the in the car, be playing some music, and um, and I haven't done anything else either. 
The rest of it's totally stock, other than the head unit, aftermarket head unit. And um, so, you know, good song comes on, got some bass going, and people are like, yeah, sounds pretty good. Well, what do you think's in there? Oh, a couple of tens. Sure. Pop the trunk, just a little cube hidden in the back. And so, you know, and that was two ninety nine or so. Yeah. They typically range from two hundred bucks to the diamond ones about four fifty, I think. But you know, if you want to add that base and you don't want to break the bank, even as a stepping stone, as a start, as a start to like building a stereo, it's a really, really, really good place to start. That's cool, yeah. Corey. That and and looking at that, like you don't realize it's such a small chassis and design that you could put that. Under a seat somewhere, you could do anything mm -hmm. you want. Hundred percent yeah. in a trunk, under a seat, um, hidden. A lot of guys will put them under the like the spare tire, um, oh, right. and then you don't even yeah. see them. They're totally cool. totally stealth. Um, most of them follow a similar kind of thin design like this. The one that I have is a little bit different. It's like again, it's a cube, but yeah, they're and again, amplifier, everything built in. You give it power basically. You give yep. it a source, and it's good to and go. It's good to go. Nice. Yeah. Um, the next one is actually is work lights. Uh, so this is shifting gears a little bit. Work lights is one of those things that you often don't really know how valuable it is until your your janky halogen, you know, Canadian Tire yep. 999 special burns out, yep. and then you need something. So we have a series of work lights from Bright Source. They make about six or seven of them now. I think there's a bunch of different ones. They're all compact. They're all super duper bright LED. They're all rechargeable. Um, most of them have like a magnetic base that you can stick it, right. aim it. I think the price point on something like this is about 60, 70 bucks, right around yeah. there. Um, super duper bright. Again, they also have um, output as well. And some of them have built in Bluetooth speakers. So oh, mm -hmm. I go. personally, when I'm you know, in the garage and I've got a you know, beer cracked and I'm going to be in there for an hour, I like to put on music. Sure. I have a separate speaker, but you know, a lot of guys, if you want to sort of integrate the both, and again, we're talking now like under 200 bucks easily. Right. Work light, speaker, if you don't need it for a light, put it up on your bench, you got some music. Really, really, really good option. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is styling. So it's no secret that cars are a fashion show. Yep. I don't think I'm crazy saying that. Nope. No. Looking good is half the battle. Yep. Yep. And one of the great things about cars and modifying cars is you can make it look any way you want. Right. And generally speaking, interior pieces are a pretty budget-friendly way to go and do that. So energy, you know, hits the price point. This is an example of one of their wheels. This is their um, this is their get nuts. Um, it's signed by uh, Wang. You know, mm. Wang. <laughs> yeah. You know. So get nuts signed by Wang. <laughs> get nuts signed by Wang. Yeah. Personal uh, favorite, of Corey. <laughs> Point being, <laughs> super super good looking wheel. You know, nice Alcantara, nice stitching. Um, it's got some green highlights on it, and this you know these all fall in well under three hundred bucks. They all between two right. and three somewhere yeah. in there. Um, little things like this they add style, but also you know, I've done a bunch of steering wheel swaps. Just the feel of having a new nicer wheel in your sure. hands it really goes a long way. It's maybe not a performance part per se. But aesthetic changes really change the way that your car feels to you. Yep. And that's what it's all about. Um, you know, they've got some e-brake handles and shift knobs, and now we're talking, you know, well under $100 for a right. lot of those things. Yeah. So it's simple, easy, budget ways to improve your car for you. And that's really what it's all about. It is. Mm -hmm. and, and like you said, fashion show, it's a style. It's an extension yep. of your style. You put that wheel in your car because of what it, your car, the, the idea you're going with or what you're doing. Or you just like it, sure, and you want it in your car. And a steering wheel is, in my opinion, a performance upgrade. If you're a drift guy, like we had, we talked last week, or you like to go on the road course or whatever, a steering wheel that's got uh, a little size to it, you know, a little different weight to it, it helps you drive. No, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, no, totally. Absolutely. Sierra, what? Um, uh, what do you got? A couple topics I picked. Um, one of the first ones I didn't really make any notes on, but it kind of gets overlooked by a lot of people, is just a simple upgrade that you can do by adding a replacement k and filter sure. to your factory airbox. Using anything that's not just like a simple paper media and yeah. going for something that's like the oil cotton, um, you're going to get better flow out of it, absolutely, as well as better filtration because these are, uh, most k and filters either come in a four or a six layer, and so you're going to get better airflow. It even shows on the back here, you can see a little bit of ratings that they have for sure. each vehicle depending on what it's for. Uh, I also thought I'd touch on that one with, like, with talking about the K&N filters is K&N, um, they're now in the cabin filter market as well. Right. And they're making washable, reusable cabin filters. Um, 
It's something like I, I think that was you that mentioned where every time your wife goes to get her oil changed at the lube shops or whatever, it's something that they try to catch her on every single time. Absolutely. It is a cabin filter and like you, you know you need one, but it, it's nice to have one that you, now you know you can wash and reuse and you don't got to worry about the guys at the lube shops trying to tag you for an extra 60 bucks each time you go in there. And would you say an in-cabin filter is something that most people could probably change? Uh, you know, it depends on the vehicle because, like, I have seen some where they're just easy to get to. There's just a couple of clips and away you go. Um, on uh, the boyfriend's truck, per se, when we brought it in here, we had Ian look at it. And it was actually about a 45-minute job hmm. to get so in varies. there. So, yeah. like, it, it totally varies depending on the vehicle. Um, and their simple upgrade, you can notice a little bit more pep in your step when you throw one of their um, engine air filters on, for sure. But... Um, another thing I thought I'd mention, I didn't bring anything with me for this one, is Husky Liners. Right. Um, most Husky Liners we have, we can get them, um, you can get them in either just like the front set, the rear set, uh, a cargo mat, which I actually I bought for my Explorer right after I bought it because of my dogs. And it was definitely one of the best investments that I could have possibly made for that thing. So they don't have to defrost all over the carpet on the sure. back seats that are yeah. folded down. I can just take it and dump all the water out after. But um, Husky Liners, they're, they're a fantastic investment with the two different series that we have. But they're just going to keep the inside of your vehicle from that moldy mildewy smell like the that you get in the carpet when you have your boots on like you're getting in there three times a day and having all the sure. snow and the water melt off your boots like it's gonna start to stink and it's also not gonna look very nice sure. once well, your carpets are stained yeah it's protective if you love your car yeah protect your like car. yeah exactly and, and and like a husky liner set like for Two hundred and thirty dollars, I think. We have sets here for most like Dodge Ram for F one fifties and some SUVs. You can get the fronts, uh, the front two, and then the rear one piece. So they're they're really cost effective, and they're they're definitely worth it if it's a vehicle you plan on keeping for a little while. Um, it, yeah, just to to talk of Husky Liner, I mean, it it's something that when I buy a vehicle, you know, I put them in right away because mm -hmm. I mean, Corey and I can attest to when you have children. Yeah. I mean, you know, hey, I'm done with my juice box, and they, they give it the huck. The, yeah. yeah, the toss, you know, <laughs> and it's still got a little bit of juice in it. It always does. It hits the Husky Liner floor mat, mm -hmm. and it holds it. Yeah. So you go to the car wash, you pull it out, you wash, you put it back in, it's like, wow, the carpets actually look pretty good. So, yeah, they're, they're strong mats, too. Like, they can definitely withstand a pressure washer at the car wash absolutely. or whatever if you're going to do it at the driveway at home. Um, they're really durable and, and Husky Liner does have like a guaranteed for life stamp on those guys there, there. So um, they're by. stand by their product for sure Another thing I wanted to talk about that's a, definitely a little bit more like generic like we mentioned um, It's gonna be just like a simple oil catch can um, Now like with myself like the last two vehicles I've owned um, were factory turbo cars right. and on anything that's boosted We meant like we were talking about the other day. It's definitely a good idea to run a catch can just mm. it's more of a just in case more preventative maintenance than any sort of performance gain you'd rather make sure that whatever contaminants are not going to be there basically the little blurb that i wrote out here for myself um, what an oil catch can does is it's used to catch um, blow by contaminants from the crankcase that would normally end up recirculated back into your intake. And those contaminants over time, they could build up on your, in your intake. They also could build up on your valves. And once it's gone that far, you're going to start to hear some clunks and stuff like that. So, yeah. And some, some of those contaminants can be um, like leftover fuel and yeah. some oil True. contaminants. And generally Air. stuff that, yeah, generally stuff that after post combustion, combustion, you don't want to recycle it back. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So more or less it's preventative maintenance. They make some, um, we have some from energy that are a little bit more um, style driven as well as some from Morosa, which are a little bit more, um, I guess like ease of use driven because like they, they come like completely universal in the kit. Like it's made for any DIY guy. It comes with all the lines that you need. And you more or less just have to figure out where on your vehicle you're going to put it. Sure. Um, they come with the bracket and something like these guys here, the Morosa ones for, I think these guys are billet aluminum, um, about $197. Big energy one. These things are only like $110. Man, they look really good. And yeah. Like they, they look nice. I know that's another thing that a lot of people put on their vehicles just so like when they open the hood, oh yeah, check totally. out, check sure. out my... Uh, because race car. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, Chango <laughs> Mike Hatch can. Yeah, so exactly. it, it's it's an easy upgrade. Like, and I've I've seen some because I've been looking for one for my Explorer. They're a little bit harder to find because it's not quite the same engine bay as in the Ford trucks. Um, but like, I found one online from a company in the states. It's got the lines on it already. It's already got the fittings on it. So I literally just have to undo two fittings, nice. mount a bracket, and away you go. Like, nice. it's a super easy to do. Um, Preventative maintenance upgrade, I guess I would call it, rather than any sort of performance upgrade. That's great. Um, you know, I've, when we talked about doing the budget, you know, thinking of how we can, you know, make your dollars go farther and stuff, you know, I think when, when a lot of people say performance, and Corey, you touched on this and, and it hit the nail on the head with, it's not always about going fast. Mm -hmm. You know, when people say, oh, how can I upgrade my vehicle? Well, upgrades can be anything and everything. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what the first thing I thought of was lights. You know, I... I thought to myself, I consider it a performance upgrade because you're getting better performance out of your lights. Totally. So, you know, you look at my 05 Chev Hafton. They've got the standard halogen lights in there. Yeah, you can change the bulbs and stuff, but the best upgrade a person can do today, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is swapping to an LED or HID if, if that's your preference, but the light output in comparison, Yeah. I mean, it, they're night, literally night and day, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean that, but... Um, but you come in, want to do the conversion LED, so I did exact, exactly that. These are about 259 bucks. They take an hour of labor for our guys in the shop to do it. So, and it's a com immediate improvement on, on your factory headlights. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I look at that and go do a little highway driving, mainly city, but bottom line with the weather changes we have in Alberta or anywhere you're going for that matter, Having a good set of headlights people can see, you can see, is, in my opinion, a great upgrade you can do for, for you know, the under 500 or in the $500 range. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the install on, on a lot of the older vehicles, like my truck, 05, whatever, is pretty basic. Some of the newer, newer stuff, yeah, it, I mean, it takes a little bit more. But bottom line is you're buying the set of bulbs for 250 bucks. It, it's it's worth the investment and and it's given you a performance upgrade on your vehicle. Yeah, and it's a you know it's a set that you're not going to be changing out. It's not your halogens that you've got to change out once a year. You know these typically LEDs will have a ten thousand hour rating on them. Right. So we're talking about you know you shouldn't have to test them for years. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then the next thing I thought of, you know, it was it was interesting. You know, somebody comes into the store. You know, I want to do an upgrade. The budget's not really there. I've got a little bit of money to spend. Well. We talked sound at the start of the show, you know, of that muscle car and that, you know, you get the, the feedback. Mm -hmm. And then, for, then I thought Flowmaster muffler. I mean, you know, you show up, got your truck, whatever it is, you want it to sound great. Well, you can get a Flowmaster muffler just like this one here. They're between 115 to 175 bucks, 200 bucks at some of them. They're about an hour to put in and instantly, didn't hear you on the way in, we can hear you on the way out. Yeah. Yep. And, and it's... It's funny, and I don't know if it's if it's a guy thing or just a. a <laughs> we're the ones, in my opinion, we're the ones that when we go through the tunnel, we downshift and rev it up so we can hear it every single time. Every single time. Every single time. I will. Yes. <laughs> I'm not. Saying, that's why I said it's not just a guy thing. I, you know, I'm speaking from myself. Yes. I will reroute my drive to drive through the noisiest places. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then, when you get a new exhaust put on, you're in the parking lot and you're revving the piss out of your vehicle because you want to hear it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then all the way home. You're hearing it as well. Yeah. So. And, and it's it's funny, I was just thinking the Flowmaster muffler change, you know, what a what a great simple, easy performance budget upgrade that's been that thing for sixty years. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, oh, like yeah. it's been like that's been a staple what do you, what do you want to do? Change the muffler. You know, yeah. Yeah. performance yeah. gain, cool gain, makes you feel, you know, better driving a you know you get to hear the motor and i mean that's been we've been doing this one simple swap again for 60 odd years and right. it works just as well as it did then yeah ex exactly yeah. and and they have their own sounds and we have other mufflers you can get from from magnaflow and, and borla or wherever i mean yeah. the the preference is yours right mm -hmm. but you're right Corey. it's forever it's the sound right right yeah. Yeah. um and, and the last thing for me i mean we're all watching media we're all watching stuff uh, our VP, uh, Sean, sent, sent me a, a bulletin from, we have Spray 9 in stock. Yep. Yep. And, and we got a bulletin from them amid all the stuff that's happening in the world today that with the spread of Corona, COVID-19, whatever, 
Um, they're expecting a shortage of spray nine and that they're trying to do everything they can to get this disinfectant spray to all their customers because the demand is now through the roof. Why that one specifically? Well, apparently it, it disinfects everything and kills everything. Including our friendly COVID. Yeah, that's, that's what the bulletin kind of alluded to. Okay. We're not medical professionals <laughs> by any means. I'm not telling anybody that this is the be-all end-all. <laughs> We're yeah. not going yeah. on record saying yeah. Yeah. that this product will cure it. No. Yeah. But no. it is a disinfectant. It is. It does work very well. It does. Okay. And, and it's in great stock right now, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say that once we're down to the last one, the price might go up, but who knows? <laughs> you, know? you know, I think that's the way the, the world is going, you know, with uh, Purell hand sanitizer selling at 50 sure. bucks or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's interesting times. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, get your spray nine at JB's Power Center. Definitely under $500. It, for yeah. Now. I would, yeah. Well, for now. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Maybe, Claire, that's our business idea for the private equity that we hey, sh 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 yeah, no, no, we buy all the stock. Like, no, cuts. Yeah, cut, yeah. Too much. Too much. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, yeah, boy. no. In stock, get it well at last. Lots of spray nine. <laughs> it's, yeah. Lots of spray. Yeah, we have yeah. lots of spray yeah. nine. Yeah. You know. Perfect. Well, geez, I think that rounds it up pretty good. I um, think so, too. Yeah. You know, we, we covered a lot of cool stuff, talked a lot of products, talked about ourselves a little bit for the first time. And um, I think it's probably safe to say we'll, we'll wrap it up with that. Yeah. So thanks okay. again, everyone, for tuning in. And um, we will catch you next time. See you. Thanks for tuning in to JB's PowerCast. Check out jbspowercenter.com for the latest updates. You can find the JB's PowerCast at jbspowercenter.com, YouTube, and Facebook. Don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe. JB's PowerCast is a JB's Power Center production and is produced by Stephen M.D. and Sean Lansman.